by uniting church and state when our Constitution, the First Amendment to the Constitution, forbids strictly the union of church and state? Well, we would like to deal with a few of those matters and answer that question uh, in our session this afternoon. Uh, we want to go back to where we were when we ended our last session. We noticed that the United States rose providentially, didn't it? In other words, this nation didn't simply arise because, uh, you know, it fought with another nation or by accident. This nation was raised by God for a providential reason, and that is so that there would be a center from where present truth in these last days could be taken to the world. And that is exactly what has happened. Now, um, we covered that point of the providential rise of the United States. I want to review some things about the two horns. The two horns represent civil and religious liberty, and behind that idea is the idea of two kingdoms in the United States, the church and the state. Now, much is being said in evangelical circles these days uh, that Americans need to be patriotic and they need to be Christian. And in order to be patriotic, they say, you have to have the government support religion uh, through things like inscriptions uh, on our currency, like school vouchers to send our kids to uh, sectarian schools, like implementing school prayer in our schools, like having the government give us money for charitable choice, uh, religious displays on government property. You know, they say that would show that you are Christian and that you are patriotic at the same time. But as we have already seen, to separate the affairs of the church and the state is Christian, because that's what Jesus did. He said, render to Caesar that which is Caesar's, and to God that which is God's. So in order to be Christian, you would have to have the same view that Jesus Christ had, right? Now, it is also patriotic to separate church and state, and you say, why? Because the founding fathers of the United States separated church and state. And so it is patriotic and Christian to believe in the separation of church and state. In fact, it would be anti-Christian and anti-patriotic to unite church and state, because it would be contrary to what Jesus taught, and it would also be contrary to what the founding fathers taught. Are you following me? Yes. Now let's take a look at the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, and here's where you're going to say, Pastor, we just cannot understand how the United States is going to make an image of the papacy by joining church and state when the First Amendment is so clear. We've read the First Amendment before, but now I want to read it again because we're going to take two stories from the Old Testament that illustrate the first two clauses of the First Amendment. Once again, the, the First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Second clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And then comes the third clause, which guarantees civil rights. See the other horn on, the, on this beast. Or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So basically, what the First Amendment is saying is that there's a separation of church and state, even though, though that terminology is not specifically used because Congress cannot make any law that establishes any religious observance, nor can it forbid people to practice their religion freely. And the third clause guarantees full civil rights, civil and religious liberty in the First Amendment to the Constitution. Now there are two stories in the Old Testament that illustrate what happens when a nation violates these two clauses of the First Amendment to the Constitution, the religious clauses of the Constitution. The first story that we find is in Daniel chapter 3. There we find that Nebuchadnezzar, who for a while behaved as a beast, raised up an image, and he commanded everyone to worship the image on pain of death. 
You know this really foreshadows the story of Revelation chapter 13. Now what was Nebuchadnezzar? He was a civil ruler, right? So was he establishing a religious observance? Yes, he raised an image and he says everybody's going to worship in this way. Everybody is going to worship this image. Now had God commanded Israel to obey uh, their, their civil ruler, the king? You can read this, I'm not going to read this passage because it's uh, relatively long. Jeremiah 27 verses 4 through 8, God said to Israel, you subject yourselves to the authority of Babylon, of King Nebuchadnezzar. And lo and behold, when Nebuchadnezzar raises up his image, we find three individuals that disobey the civil power. So were they disobeying God? Well, didn't God say you're, going, you're supposed to obey King Nebuchadnezzar? No. Yes, of course God said obey Nebuchadnezzar. But was Nebuchadnezzar overstepping his level of authority by legislating a religious observance? Yes. Absolutely. So were these three young men right in practicing civil disobedience? Absolutely. Because the king had no right to legislate an establishment of a religious observance. So he raise up, raises up this image and he commands everyone to worship the image. Now let me ask you, did this religious decree also lead to taking away the civil rights of these three young men? What is the ultimate civil right? The ultimate civil right is life. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Let me ask you, when he established religion, did that put their right to life at risk? Yes, you see, when, when the government or the civil power establishes religion, the result is that you lose also the civil liberties that are guaranteed by the First Amendment. Are you following me? Now, the story tells us that these three young men uh, simply stood and they said, we will not worship this image that Nebuchadnezzar has raised up because the civil power was establishing a religious observance. There was no human court of appeal for these three young men. All of the power seemed to be in the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. But this is where God intervened. And Jesus himself went into the furnace and he delivered these three young men for standing firm. Now there's another story in the book of Daniel that illustrates what happens when a civil ruler forbids the free exercise of religion. And that story is found in Daniel chapter 6. Now the story in Daniel chapter 6 tells us that you know God placed Darius to rule there in the kingdom of Medo-Persia. Now this story in Daniel chapter 6 is a little different than the one in Daniel chapter 3 because Daniel chapter 3 shows the dangers of a civil power establishing a religious observance. Daniel 6 illustrates the dangers of a civil power forbidding the free exercise of religion. And basically what the king, what King Darius said was, you know, uh, and by the way this, was, this plot was planned by his advisors, uh, he says nobody can make any petition of man or God for a per period of 30 days except from the king. So what is he doing? He's forbidding the right of everyone to pray to their God. Is that a restriction of their free exercise? He's not establishing a religious observance. He's not saying you have to worship this way. What he's saying is you can't worship this way. In other words, he's taking away the free exercise of religion. And of course the Bible tells us that Daniel said, I am going to disobey this law. And in fact the Bible tells us that Daniel went to his, to his room and as was his custom since early days, he opened up his windows and he turned towards Jerusalem and he prayed to God three times a day. Did all of the cards appear to be in the hands of his enemies? Absolutely. It looked like Daniel was going to be devoured by the lions. But once again, God sent his angel, by the way, this is the angel of the covenant. 
he sent his angel and closed the mouths of the lions and Daniel was delivered from certain death. What happens when the civil power establishes religion? Persecution. What happens when the civil power forbids the free exercise of religion? Persecution. When religion is established the result is that people lose their civil liberties as well. They're thrown into prison or they're fined, their goods are confiscated, and in some cases they are condemned to die. Incidentally, neither Nebuchadnezzar nor Darius really understood what God was trying to teach them. Because after uh, Nebuchadnezzar raised up the image and Jesus himself came into the furnace and delivered the three young men, Nebuchadnezzar said, folks, now I command everyone to be very careful about saying anything negative about the God of Daniel, because he will be cut into pieces, their houses will be razed to the ground. Was that legitimate? That's illegitimate. See, you can't force people to practice a false religious observance, and you cannot force them even to follow the true religion, because the civil power has no right to do that. Religion is something that exists between you and your God. By the way, Darius didn't understand either because afterwards he made a decree that every human being should fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. Illegitimate decree because people are to fear and tremble before God not because the civil power tells you to but because it comes from your heart because you love the Lord and because you have a strong relationship with him. Are you with me? So the book of Daniel illustrates what happens when the establishment and free exercise clauses of the Constitution are violated. Now let's talk about the First Amendment in the end time. Someone might ask, how is all this related to the United States in the end time? Well, the prophecy of Revelation 13 verse 11, folks, indicates that the United States will eventually violate both the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause of the Constitution of the United States. And the result will be persecution and eventually a death decree. You say, well that could never happen in these free United States of America, the home of the free and the land of the brave. It could never happen here. Never say never. The prophecy of Revelation 13, 11 tells us very clearly that this beast has two horns like a lamb, one nation that upholds these two principles that are based on the idea of two kingdoms, but it will end up speaking like a dragon while it still has the two horns. Now, let me ask you this. For any thinking person, even for a child, would a Sunday law be unconstitutional in the United States? Come on, folks, let's be real. Would it be establishing a religious observance? Of course it would be. Would forbidding the observance of the Sabbath be a violation of the free exercise clause of the Constitution? Any child would understand that because it's forbidding. If, if you're forbidden to keep the Sabbath, you're, you're being forbidden from practicing your religion. If Sunday is established, that means that the government is establishing a religious observance which is strictly forbidden by the First Amendment to the Constitution. Notice this statement from Ellen White in the book Maranatha, page 177. The time will come when men will not only forbid Sunday work, but they will try to force men to labor on the Sabbath and to subscribe to Sunday observance. And now notice what they will forfeit if they don't. Will they forfeit their civil liberties? Yes. Or forfeit their freedom and what else? And their lives. Uh, you see that these two horns are connected in a certain way? If you don't believe they're separate, if you unite them, the result is going to be what? Persecution. Does the book of Revelation chapter 13 tell us very clearly that whoever does not worship the, the image of the beast will be killed? Amen. Yes. So this isn't Ellen White that is speaking. This is the Bible that is speaking. 
And not that we don't believe in Ellen White because she certainly is in harmony with scripture. Now on the next page, during the 1260 years, the papacy attempted to change the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. That happened during the period of papal dominion, right? That thought it could change God's what? God's law. Now did Protestants assimilate the Sunday when they broke away from the Roman Catholic Church? Were they ever, ever able to get rid of Sunday as a day of rest? No. And this is the reason why in the future apostate Protestantism in the United States will enforce the change in God's law that was made during the 1260 years and will force everyone to receive the mark of the beast. A comparison of Daniel, this is an important point, a comparison of Daniel 7.25 with Revelation 13 verses 3 through 10 reveals something very interesting. In Daniel 7 you have four things that the little horn, that are related to the little horn. Whereas in Revelation 13 only three appear to be repeated. Now what are the three, the, the, four, the four that we find in Daniel 7? It says the little horn will speak words against the Most High. It will persecute the saints of the Most High. It will think to change times and laws. And it will rule for a period of 1260 years. Time, times, and the dividing of time. But when you read Revelation 13 verses 3 through 10, does it say there that the beast will speak great words against the Most High? Yes. Does it say that the beast will persecute the saints of the Most High? Most certainly. Does it say that the beast will rule for the same time period, 42 months? Yes, but you go to Revelation 13, you say, where is the change in the law? The answer is that the change in the law is there. It's called the mark of the beast. It is there in Revelation 13. The change in the law is the imposition of the mark of the beast. Now aren't Sunday laws unconstitutional? Of course they would be. <laughs> you know wouldn't the establishment of Sunday as a day of worship by Congress be a clear violation of the, of the establishment clause? Of course. And an anti-Sabbath law would be an attack on the free exercise clause of the Constitution. I'm quite sure that when that time comes for the Sunday law, the constitutionality of such laws will be challenged in court. Do you think they're going to be challenged in court uh, when, when Congress makes a Sunday law and eventually forbids the observance of the Sabbath? You better believe it's going to go all the way to where? To the Supreme Court. But according to the Bible, the remnant's appeal will fall upon deaf ears. There will be no redress of grievances for God's faithful remnant. No civil right there. Now let's talk about profession and practice. It bears noting that we are not to expect the eradication of the First Amendment from the Constitution. In other words, the horns are not going to be broken, folks. The horns are still going to be there. The United States is still going to profess to believe in religious liberty and in civil liberty. They're not going to get rid of that idea because that's the foundation of the nation. The First Amendment will remain in place. But what will most likely happen is that the Supreme Court will declare in a time of a dire national emergency, like for example an economic meltdown, which is coming, we are 19 trillion dollars in debt and according to the experts it will be four more trillion by the end of this year. You know, <laughs> that cannot be sustained. You can't continue printing money indefinitely because reckoning day will eventually come. So perhaps in a time of a, of a meltdown of the economy, in a period where there are terrible natural disasters, perhaps many terrorist attacks all simultaneously at the same time, perhaps diseases, pandemics, and epidemics. In other words, a time when society and when nature and when the economy appear to be falling apart, the idea is let's return to God. And the return to God will involve obligating everyone 
to go to church on Sunday and there will be a group that says no and so eventually you will have anti-Sabbath laws as well. So basically it's not a, the case that the United States is going to eliminate the First Amendment to the Constitution. What they're going to do, they're going to profess to keep it, the two horns will be there, but it will repudiate it in practice. It will have one theory on one side, but it will have a different practice. Now notice this statement from Ellen White. It's rather lengthy but profound. Great Controversy, page 442. The lamb-like horns and dragon voice of the symbol point to a striking contradiction between the professions and the practice of the nation there rep thus represented. The speaking of the nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. Once we understand that, uh, that the two horns represent a Republican style of government and represents freedom of religion, we know that in a Republican style of government, how does the nation speak? It speaks through its laws and through the Supreme Court. By the way, it's, it's a judiciary. She continues writing, by such an action it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles that it has put forth as the foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and exercise all the power of the first beast, that is making an image of it, plainly foretells the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifested by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. And the statement that the beast with two horns causeth the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. See that's the image, right? An act of homage to the papacy, a replica or an image or a copy of the papacy. She continues writing, such action would be directly contrary to the principles of this government. Is that true? Yes. Absolutely. To the genius of its free institutions, to the direct and solemn avowals of the Declaration of Independence and to the Constitution. The founders of the nation wisely sought to guard against the employment of secular power on the part of the church with its inev inevitable result, intolerance and persecution. The Constitution provides that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Can an atheist be president of the United States? You say, Pastor, you are not a Christian. <laughs> an atheist can be president because he's a civil ruler. Right? Can a Jew be a president of the United States? Uh, can a Muslim be? Now that's a little more difficult. <laughs> they would have to agree to the principles of the Constitution. You see that becomes much more complicated because Muslims, church and state are what? They're bound together. Would he be willing to abide by the free principles of the United States or would he try to apply Sharia law in the United <laughs> States? It would become a little bit more complicated. But as long as the candidate said, I will abide by the principles of the Constitution of the United States, religion cannot be a factor in whether a person can occupy that position. Uh, it can, Ellen White continues uh, writing, only in flagrant violation of these safeguards to the nation's liberty can civil authority enforce any religious observance. Notice, any religious observance. But the, here comes the key portion, but the inconsistency of such action is no greater than is represented in the symbol. It is the beast with lamb-like horns in profession, pure, gentle, and harmless, that speaks as a dragon. She had it straight, didn't she? 120, over 120 years ago, she had it very, very straight. Now, the United States has three branches of government, like many other nations in the world today. We have the executive branch, 
we have the legislative branch and we have the judicial branch. And as we know, the legislative branch of our government draws up the laws. The executive branch of government enforces the laws, and the judicial branch, primarily the Supreme Court, interprets the laws to tell us whether those laws that are drawn up by Congress are constitutional or not. Now the big question is, which of these three branches of government is the most powerful? Well, some people say it's the executive because they make people keep the laws. Other people say, well, you know, but he, the, the, the president could not execute the laws unless Congress drew them up. So Congress is the most powerful. But really, the strongest and most powerful branch of government in the United States is the judicial branch, primarily the Supreme Court. Let me ask you, could Congress draw up a law that is unconstitutional, and if the Supreme Court says it's constitutional, will that be the law of the land? You better believe it will. And so in the hands of nine individuals on the Supreme Court of the United States, they can say whether a law is constitutional or not. So Congress can draw up a law, but if the Supreme Court says it's not constitutional, it will not become law. Are you with me? Or it might become law, and then people appeal it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court can say, go back with that. That cannot be a law. The most powerful branch of government in the United States is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is composed of nine individuals. Now, if you don't think that the Supreme Court is the most powerful branch of government in the United States, all you have to do is consider the election of the year 2000. You remember the election when they, well, the problem with the hanging chads <laughs> in Florida, of all places? You know, they, had, they weren't sure whether George Bush or Al Gore had won the election, so you go for weeks and lawyers are involved and they're going to a lower court and then to an intermediate court, then to a higher court, and finally the case ends up where? At the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court basically says, George Bush won the election. Could that be appealed? It was not appealed. You can't appeal it. It's the highest court of appeal. In other words, the, the Supreme Court elected the President of the United States. Now, if you don't think that the Supreme Court is the most powerful, on June 26 of last year, the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage all across the United States of America. Five to four decision, but the majority rules in the Supreme Court. And so it's interesting to notice the composition of the Supreme Court. Up till recently, the Supreme Court had six Roman Catholics and three Jews. Now, since Justice Scalia died, there are five Roman Catholics, and uh, President Obama has just nominated Merrick Garland, who is a Jew, to occupy the, pay, the place that was left vacant by Justice Scalia. Uh, the Republicans have said there's not a ghost of a chance that we'll even consider that name even though uh, Orrin Hatch of Utah uh, several years ago when uh, this same justice was being nominated to a lower court, he said this would be a wonderful choice. But Republicans are saying, let's let the, uh, the season of uh, these primaries get by the election and let the next president then elect the person that will uh, occupy the position in the Supreme Court. Now, uh, so basically, if this individual were elected, you would have five Roman Catholics and you have four Jews on the court in a country where 47% of the, of the population are Protestants. It's unbelievable that in the United States the Supreme Court has not one Protestant on the Supreme Court and it has five Roman Catholics. And listen carefully, this, this is, it does not bode well because three of the justices are way up in years. You know, Justice Ginsburg has been, has been uh, pretty ill recently. And, you know, it makes me think of Justice Kennedy. He's getting up there in years. And so the next president of the United States, or perhaps, uh, you know, if, he, if the, the president wins two terms, uh, is going to conceivably elect three justices to the Supreme Court. Now, can you imagine a Supreme Court where you have six, seven, or perhaps even eight Roman Catholics on the court? Even five Roman Catholics on the court does not bode well because the Supreme Court rules by majority. 
Now you say, well, you know, this could, this could really never happen in the United States, even if you have Roman Catholics on the court, because Roman Catholics are red-blooded Americans before they are Roman Catholics. Well, let's notice what Ellen White had to say about this. Uh, December 11, 1888, in the heat of the debate over the Sunday Laws that had been um, proposed by Henry Blair uh, of New Hampshire, Ellen White wrote this, Christians do not see that if a Protestant government sacrifices the principles that have made them a free independent nation and through legislation brings into the Constitution principles that will propagate papal falsehood and papal delusion, they are plunging into the Roman horrors of the Dark Ages. Now some people say, wow, Ellen White is really exaggerating things here. <laughs> well, immediately you probably won't have the horrors of the Dark Ages, but if you're joining church and state together and the papacy is in charge, what would you expect down the road? the same image of what existed during the 1260 years. Some people, even Adventists, say, ah, Pastor Bohr is an alarmist because he talks about all the, the possibility of this country, the United States of America, that has the First Amendment to the Constitution that has always guaranteed civil and religious liberty, that that could ever happen in this country? That doesn't matter if there's five or six Roman Catholics on the court. That doesn't make any difference, is what they say. Notice what Ellen White had to say in Great Controversy, page 580, about the loyalty of Roman Catholics, who they owe their first loyalty to. The Roman Catholic Church, with all its ramifications throughout the world, forms one vast organization under the control and designed to serve the interests of the papal see. Its millions of communicants in every country on the globe are instructed to hold themselves as bound in allegiance to the Pope. Whatever their nationality or their government, they are to regard the authority of the church as above all other. Though they may take the oath pledging their loyalty to the state, yet back of this lies the vow of obedience to Rome absolving them from every pledge inimical to her interests. So uh, we, we can see that an, an oath taken of loyalty to the United States takes second place to an oath of loyalty to the Roman Catholic papacy. In recent years there's been a fascination of Protestants with the papacy. It's led some prominent political leaders such as Jeb Bush, Newt Gingrich, and Tony Blair to renounce their Protestant heritage and to join the Roman Catholic Church. Many Protestants these days point to the papacy's fight for human rights and fight for religious freedom and fight in favor of the poor and for life and for morality and for conventional marriage and against what Pope John Paul II spoke of as a culture of death and therefore even some Adventists are saying the papacy has changed. The papacy of the past is not the same papacy as today. But my question is this, has the Roman Catholic Church changed any of its beliefs? Has it gotten rid of any of its dogmas and practices? None! You know what it has had? A facelift. But besides, be, uh, underneath the beautiful face is an ugly system, a system that joins church and state and is simply waiting for its opportunity to spring again into active despotism. In fact, one Roman Catholic said, in the minority we are a lamb, in equality we are a serpent, and in the majority we are a lion. Ellen White expressed it in a different way. She said, it is part of her, the papacy's policy, to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. But beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, do you know what a chameleon is? I don't think we have chameleons here in Fresno. You know, they're mostly from the tropics. 
A chameleon is a lizard that changes colors depending on the background that it's on. So she says, beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. I'm sure you've heard the story of the scorpion and the frog, right? You all heard the story of the scorpion and the frog? Yeah, crossing the river. Probably you all heard that story. You know, uh, just to, to abbreviate the story, you know, the, 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 the frog, I mean, the, the scorpion wanted to cross the river. The scorpions can't swim, but the frog can. And so the scorpion says to the frog, uh, you know, why don't you let me jump on, my, on your back and then we'll cross the river. That way I won't drown. And the frog says, no way, you're a scorpion. You're going to sting me and I'm going to die. And the scorpion says, don't be real. I would never do that. Hey, if I stung you, we would both drown. You would die from the sting and I would die drowned. I would never do that. And so there's a lot of dialogue going on and eventually the, the frog says, okay, okay, get on my back, I'll take you across. Right in the middle of the river, the scorpion stings the frog. And the frog, poisoned and just about ready to die, says to the scorpion, I, I thought you said that you would not sting me. Why did you sting me? And do you know what he said? He said, because it's in my nature. Because it's in my nature. See? Beneath the beautiful words and the beautiful actions, you have the same identical system. I already read the next statement of Ellen White, so we're not going to read it again. But when this happens, when the United States, by a national act of Congress, establishes a national Sunday law, we are told that the United States will have made an image of the papal hierarchy. Let's read these statements that we find at the bottom of the page. In order for the United States to form an image of the beast, the religious power must so control the civil government that the authority of the state will also be employed by the church to accomplish her own ends. Page 581, Ellen White wrote, Rome is aiming to reestablish her power to recover her lost supremacy. Do you see the deadly wound being commented on here? Let the principle once be established in the United States that the church may employ or control the power of the state, that religious observances may be enforced by secular laws. In short, that the authority of church and state is to dominate the conscience and the triumph of Rome in this country is assured. If it's, uh, if, if it's true that the triumph of Rome in this country, then this country is going to speak like who? A like a dragon, like Rome, she's saying. In the next statement, Great Controversy 445, when the leading churches of the United States uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy and notice what the result will be, and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably what? Will inevitably result. On the next page we find this significant statement that the whole world is going to follow the example of the United States because folks, the whole world is going to fall apart. You know, the pe people say, when, th when the economy of the United States sneezes, the economy of the world catches cold, right? All of the global economy is interconnected. So what happens if there's an economic meltdown in the United States? It will have a domino effect on a global scale. And you will, you know, the depression of 1929, 1930 will look like child's play compared to the global meltdown and the natural disasters, so-called natural, and uh, the criminality and the terrorist attacks, you know, as God withdraws His Spirit from this world, the heart of man becomes cruel and there's no restraint anymore of the, the savage nature of the unregenerated heart. So she says, as America, 
the land of religious liberty shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Let me ask you this, those who are fighting for a Sunday law, will they be considered patriotic? Oh yeah, we need to save the nation. Even if these must die, we must save the nation. Will they be looked upon as Christian? Yes, we want to uphold Christianity by law, but what they will be doing is unpatriotic because it's not what the Founding Fathers taught, and it will be anti-Christian because it's not what Jesus taught. So our source of authority will be what? Will be the Bible. Now there's another point that I would like to emphasize. And uh, we have several things here. Uh, I am going to jump to where it says counterfeit Holy Spirit revival. Uh, that is uh, two subtitles beyond where we're at now. Counterfeit Holy Spirit revival. There is another factor involved here that we need to take into account. Not only, listen carefully, not only will everyone in the United States go along with this idea of a Sunday law in order to bring the nation back to God because of all of the natural disasters, because of the economic meltdown, because of the criminality, because of terrorist attacks, and because of, of the fact that society is falling apart, but there's something else that Satan has planned, and that is in the United States for Protestantism to perform great signs and wonders to sustain their agenda. Does it say in Revelation chapter 13 that this false prophet makes fire descend from heaven in the sight of men and perform signs and wonders? Yeah. Folks, there will be miracles involved that will persuade people that the United States is on the right track in doing this. And therefore, people who go by feelings and by emotions and by their sight and by what they hear rather than what God has to say will be on the wrong side. You know, somebody was telling me uh, during the break, they were saying, but Pastor Bohr, isn't it true that there are some uh, couples of gay men and gay women who live together and they have marriage that it really works out okay? And they have exemplary kids. And my answer was, yes. But our standard is not whether it works. Our standard is what God says. Are you with me? In other words, just because it works, you know, we can't go along with, with uh, William James and John Dewey, the pragmatists, who actually established the philosophy of education in North America. They say, nothing is necessarily right or wrong. Test it, and if it works, it's good. No, 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 no. That's not the standard of Adventists. The standard of Adventists is, if God says it's good, you do it. And if God says it's not good, you don't do it even if it might appear to work. Amen. Now notice what we find in Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 54. Satan will work through his agents. Now notice, it says that the false prophet is going to bring fire down from heaven to the side of men, right? Now how is that done? Satan does it, but how does he do it? Through his agents. And it's the false prophet, so it must be the ministers, right? Through the ministers. So it says, Satan will work through his agents who have departed from the faith to bring fire down from heaven in the sight of men. And you say, Pastor, could that ever happen in the United States? Let me share with you a little story of, some, of an experience that I had back in 2001. In fact, it was November 13, 2001. I was in Tucson, Arizona at a speaking commitment. And uh, one Friday evening, I turned on the TV and I tuned, you know, I don't watch television a Friday evening, but uh, there were religious channels, so I tuned in to TVN, the Trinity Broadcasting Network. Uh, you know what network that is? Paul and Jan Crouch, the lady with the bushy hair and all the makeup on, the false eyelashes and so on. <laughs> uh, look, reminds, me, uh, reminds me of Tammy, B, uh, Tammy Faye Baker. Uh, but anyway, uh, I was in my room, I turned it on, and... Paul Crouch, the founder of, of TBN, was interviewing Benny Hinn. Have you ever heard of Benny Hinn? And Benny Hinn was telling 
uh, his story about his conversion and how he became a Christian. I don't know if you're aware that he was a Palestinian. And so, so basically he was saying, you know, that um, I uh, began having these dreams before I was a Christian. And I saw myself preaching before huge crowds in stadiums. And then he said this, and you have it in your syllabus. In the last 12 months I have been having some new dreams and visions. Some amazing dreams. I have been seeing fire. I have seen myself in stadiums where literal fire was falling from heaven. The glory of God is about to be revealed visibly. Does that sound similar to what we find in Revelation chapter 13? Absolutely. Of course the critical question would be this. Would the descent of fire from heaven at Hinn's meetings be a sign that the Holy Spirit is being poured out and that His message is true? Of course not. The Bible provides the standard by which all supernatural phenomena must be tested. Our senses cannot be trusted and our feelings can lead us astray. Isaiah 8 verse 20 is a verse that is very well known by Adventists. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word it is because there is no light in them. Have you ever read verse 19, the verse that comes before this? It's speaking, you know, if they tell you to go consult mediums and the dead and so on, it says don't do that. To the law and to the testimony. No, don't go by miracles, by communicating with the dead. No, no, no. Will not a people consult their God? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Are you aware of the fact that Benny Hinn, on a regular basis, goes to Forest Lawn Cemetery in Southern California, and he goes to the grave of Catherine Kuhlman, who was a basically Pentecostal spiritualist, and claims to talk to her? Are you aware that he also goes to Amy McPherson's grave and says that she communicates with him as well? So let me ask you, if he's talking with the dead, which he really isn't, they're evil spirits, would we be able to trust that the, that the fire that is falling from heaven is really of God? No! Because you must test the messenger, you must test what they teach with the Word of God and not go by what your eyes say and your ears say and your senses because if you do that you're sunk because the devil can deceive your senses. To the law and to the testimony. By the way, do you know that, the, that Ellen White tells us that before the great true revival, the loud cry and the latter rain, there is going to be a great counterfeit revival. I think we're seeing it in the Christian world now. Let's read this rather lengthy statement in Great Controversy 464. This is a chapter you ought to read. The title of it is Modern Revivals, and this chapter is being fulfilled in Seventh-day Adventist churches, believe it or not. Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. She's talking about the churches identified as Babylon. Are there true believers in Babylon? Absolutely. And then she states, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children. At that time many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and His Word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. Do you suppose the devil is kind of uh, unhappy about this? Notice what he continues saying. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. Does the devil want to hinder the loud cry and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain? Oh, he does. Does he know it's coming? You better believe he does. So Ellen White says, the enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. 
and before the time for such a movement shall come, in other words before the true revival and the loud cry come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. I believe we're seeing that even in the Adventist church today. You would not believe the number of emails and phone calls and snail mail letters that we get at Secrets Unsealed of people saying that they have no longer any place to worship in any Adventist church where they live. Now I'm not telling you the Adventist church is babbling, you need to leave the Adventist church, no, that's not the point. The point is that this false revival is even touching upon the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is God's remnant church. But that doesn't mean that we say, oh, it's, God, God, it's God's remnant, so we don't say anything about everything that's happening. Exactly. And people say, well, what should I do, bail out? No. I'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> you know, you, you, the, the old timers know where that comes from. <laughs> it comes from a product that Adventists don't exactly go for. But it's a good saying. I'd rather fight than switch. Notice what, it can, what she continues writing. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing the counterfeit. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise. What is a guise? It's a disguise. It's, it's camouflaging yourself. In other words, under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. And in this context is where we need to understand the fire that will fall from heaven in the sight of men. Now I'm going to go through the rest of this chapter very quickly by going through the subtitles. What has happened that has led Protestants to come closer and closer to Roman Catholicism? You know, if you go back 50 years, Protestants didn't want anything to do with Roman, Roman Catholic theology. They were, they were afraid of Roman Catholicism. Even, even in the times when, uh, when President Kenny, Kennedy was running for office, there was great suspicion. Why does Protestantism look so positively today at the papacy so that people like Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen and Rick Warren go to the Vatican and they say, wow, this is a wonderful pope. He's talking about climate change and about poverty and about the importance of the family unit and he washes the feet of prisoners and he hugs lepers and you know, wonderful. What factors led Protestantism to draw closer and closer? I'm going to go through the subtitles. Number one, political ecumenism. In other words, the government of the United States has become closer and closer to the Roman Catholic system in terms of the political systems. Number two, Vatican Council II. You know, Vatican Council II had a great role in, in making Protestants think that the Roman Catholic Church has changed. But the Roman Catholic Church has only had a facelift. Vatican II did not change any of the beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church. It simply gave the church a facelift. But Protestants were hoodwinked. Protestants said, hey, look, they're, they're saying mass in the languages of the people now. And uh, they're saying that people can read their Bibles. And people can even get together with, with Protestants to, uh, as study groups, you know, as long as they don't go beyond what the church teaches them. So there's been this opening, Protestants believe, in Roman Catholicism. Another factor is the election of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. See, people thought, Protestants thought that it was going to be the end of the world. Catholics were going to take over the United States, but that didn't happen. Another thing that has brought them closer, to, closer together is the ban on government-sponsored school prayer. See, Protestants and Catholics don't like that, and so they say, let's fight together against this idea of kicking prayer out of our schools. Another thing which has led them to draw closer together is Roe versus Wade. In other words, that the abortion conflict, Protestants and Catholics have come together to fight against the idea of abortion. Another factor has been the erosion of moral values in society. Catholics and Protestants say we need to draw together to moralize America once again. And they become involved in political activism. I hope you're going to read all of this. There are some amazing statements from religious leaders in the United States on, on these 
issues regarding uniting church and state and Protestants cooperating with Catholics in having a common agenda and so on. We're not going to talk about Judge Roy Moore. You can read about Judge Roy Moore, which, which when uh, he put this huge 5,300 pound monument of the Ten Commandments in his courtroom, <laughs> you know, he was actually expelled from office. And evangelicals and Catholics all drew together and say, we need to fight against this injustice. Then you have the fight over vouchers, charitable choice, and religious displays on public property. That also joined Catholics and Protestants to fight together for these things. The marriage debate has brought Protestants and Catholics together. Then there are official ecumenical documents like evangelicals and Catholics together. You need to read all of these things. The joint declaration on righteousness by faith between Lutherans and Roman Catholics. The Manhattan Declaration signed by thousands of religious leaders. Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Jewish coming together. Ellen White predicted that Protestants would join together by common points of doctrine. You've all heard about Tony Palmer and the Pope, right? right. Have you, have, did you notice that after that uh, episode, James Robinson went to the, went to the Vatican? He, he's one of these television evangelists, renowned. Joel Osteen went. Rick Warren, in fact, Rick Warren said, you know, uh, Catholics and Protestants, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe he died. We believe he resurrected. And this is enough to draw us together. Uh, you know, we have, we have all of these things in this chapter. We have just too many pages uh, to cover all of them. The makeup of the Supreme Court, the issue of immigration from Latin America, scores of Roman Catholics coming into the United States of America, reinterpreting the intent of the First Amendment to the Constitution, a shift in, shift in prophetic understanding. The papacy has created counterfeit systems of interpreting prophecy and Protestants have embraced those systems. The rise of the charismatic movement, the prestige of John Paul II, the media which has been overtaken by Roman Catholics, a renewed emphasis on Sunday. I, mean, I could go on and on, the Holy Alliance, political ecumenism, but we, we don't have any more time. Our time is up. So I hope that you will read the rest of the pages here because it would take us two or three sessions just to go through all of these statements. And you'll see the factors that have brought Protestants closer to Catholics and how it is very realistic to believe that the papacy and Protestants could unite and Protestantism could form an image of the papacy. Visit secretsunsealed.org for annual class dates and topics. Anchor is a seminary level course of study on the fundamentals of Seventh-day Adventist theology taught by Pastor Stephen Bohr and guest theologians. Seating is limited.